This episode of The Unstarving Musician is powered by Liner Notes. If you would like to learn from the hundreds of musicians and industry professionals I've spoken with for The Unstarving Musician on topics such as marketing, the songwriting process, touring, sync licensing, and more, sign up for Liner Notes. It's an email newsletter from yours truly in which I share some of the best knowledge gems I've garnered from the many conversations I've had for The Unstarving Musician podcast. You'll also find out about upcoming podcast episodes as well as occasional liner notes subscriber exclusives. Sign up at unstarvingmusician.com. It's free and you can unsubscribe at any time. This is The Unstarving Musician. I'm Rabonzo. This is my podcast. And it features conversations with independent music artists and industry professionals, plus relevant special topic episodes, all intended to help independent music artists better understand the marketing, business, and creative processes that empower us to do more of what we love, make music. So close to that drum fill. Hey, we need your support at The Unstarving Musician, and you can offer your support in many ways. You can follow us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. You can tell a friend about this podcast. That would be amazing. Or you can visit unstarvingmusician.com forward slash crowd sponsor or the show notes for this episode to learn about the many ways of offering your support. Just one more episode planned for 2022. We will be back with all new episodes January 6th of 2023. Wow, that's coming fast. How are you? How was your Thanksgiving? Did you make your stomach hurt? Did you have to hang out with family? Was it okay? (laughs) Me and my wife and one of my brothers visiting from Texas did our holiday thing at a place called Rancho Santa Marina here in Querétaro. It's uh, part of our local Ruta Vino y Queso. That's the wine and cheese trail here, which is amazing. We had a nice time. I think we almost destroyed my brother, however, that particular afternoon. Judging from the pic I snapped of him the next morning, I won't share that with you here or anywhere else, unless you happen to be at my house, maybe. I saw that my high school bandmate Rex Brown played Mexico City this past week with his former Pantera bandmate Phil Anselmo, and they were joined by guitarist Zach Wilde and Anthrax drummer Charlie Benante. Gosh, I hope I'm getting that right. I saw a video on YouTube uh, from one of the pop metal magazine sites. It looked like Rex was having a nice time. I'm happy for him. Those guys are doing a new iteration of Pantera to celebrate the lives of the brothers Dime and Vinny, who I also know from high school, knew from high school, that is. May they rest in peace. My guest for this episode is Marley XX, the multi-hyphenate musical artist, vocalist, dash, songwriter, dash, DJ, dash, producer, hailing from Washington, D.C. She's a powerhouse entertainer who has honed a distinctive style, sonically versatile and fluid in genre. That doesn't really read right, does it? But you know what I mean. Marley is busy. She's busy creating crossover-ready pop songs, having just released the singles Frequency and Only One at the time of our recent conversation. Marley's resume is pretty solid. She and her former band Marley and the Mix held a two-year residency at Indulge on U Street in D.C. and performed in venues across the U.S., including Afropunk's Battle of the Bands, SOB's in New York City, and Hollywood's legendary Whiskey A Go-Go. The band also toured internationally as co-headliners at the Essence of Seoul, S-E-O-U-L, festival in Seoul, South Korea. In uh, 2017, she launched launched her solo career with the release of a track called Shift, that landed licensing deals with TV One, HBO's The Hype, Hulu and Freeform's The Come Up, and more, I'm sure. She also became a representative at Girls Make Beats, an organization empowering the next generation of female music producers, DJs, and audio engineers. That was very cool. We didn't talk enough about that, but I wanted to make sure you understood what it was. I'm going to have a link in the show notes to Girls Make Beats if you want to learn more. She has been featured in Worldwide Waves, Black Music Month, The Washington Post, Voyage LA, and is renowned as a fearless fashionista. I'll have to agree with that statement. Her bio says she's unapologetic in her self-expression and bold 
personal style and culture a convergence of punks, punk, street, and fantasy. I don't know if that's all true or accurate, but it sounds cool. It's pretty darn close if it's not right on. In this conversation, we talk about her growing up in D.C., her latest singles, Frequency and Only One, how being a DJ helped her serve the voices of other women, becoming a producer, her sense of style, being a solo artist, learning the business of music, sync licensing, stage fright, her love of chicken and rice, and more. (laughs) And you'll hear me mention during our conversation a book by Questlove. I mentioned it in another recent episode, at least one other one, and I just wanted to make an important correction about that mention. I've twice referred to the book as Mo Betta Blues. It's actually Mo Meta Blues. It's a great book. It covers Questlove's story and perception of music in the industry. Mo Meta Blues is the name of it. Mo Meta Blues. I'll put a link in the show notes for this episode to help you find it. I liked it. I think you will too. And here is me speaking with Marley XX or Mix. Enjoy. Hey, Marley, how are you? I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing all right. Amazing. Is it really? (laughs) Yeah, it is. It could be worse. It could be bad. You know, we'll take all right. Yeah. Where are you today? I'm in LA right now. Okay. I probably, I probably read that. I read some other things about where you have been and where you're from, but uh, how is it there today? It is nice. It's beautiful. Coming from the East Coast, you know, everyone at home is cold and it's 70 degrees over here. So I can't complain. That's nice weather. I think that's about what, no, it's below. It's been below 70 most of the day today where I'm at in Mexico and Querétaro. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, I read that you are from the DC area. Is that right? Yes, very much. What was it like growing up there? It's an interesting place. You know, it's very political. It's very it's very small and it's you mean literally or kind of literally literally and figuratively it's literally like a super small city like you can drive to the other side of dc in no time you know you can go from one side of the city to another side of the city and in la that's like almost impossible you'll be in the car all day and in dc it's it's really small and then the surrounding area is just very unique you know it's it's the metropolitan area. That's why we say the DMV because it's DC, Maryland, and Virginia. And yeah, we're all kind of connected by the metro system. So it's like a really small city, but a very widespread like area. And it's very unique. I love where I'm from. Nice. So you still have family and friends there, I take it? Yeah. Yes. Most of my family, well, all of my family's there. I have zero family in LA. Lots of friends in LA, but a majority of them are from DC area. We all came over to do it, to do our thing here. Yeah, great. Okay, so you just had two releases, uh, Frequency and The Only One, or is it now it's not The Only One, it's Only One, um, came Mm -hmm. out just about not even a week ago. Yeah, November 11th. It's very exciting. Long time coming for these two singles. Yeah, how long? Two, maybe three years. Um, I moved to LA to work on an album. Uh, I had some label interest with a single that I had out it's out now it's already out on my streaming platform it's called what you want and the labels that I was meeting with had a lot of interest in it so they wanted more music they're like of course you know let's have more meetings but we can't do anything with this one song we want to see your whole your whole catalog so I moved to LA to make an album that represents the music that I want to make now and that led me to creating these two singles as a part of it and of course due to pandemic and a lot of changes in that world it's just been delayed, but I'm really, really happy to get these two out. And they're the first two singles from my album that's coming out next year. Nice. And how was the pandemic for you guys? You Were you still playing in the large band during the pandemic? No, I actually stopped playing in a large band in around 2017, um, 18, like right before I started thinking about coming to L.A. And we were not playing at the time, but it was really rough because I had only been in L.A. for seven months. So I started feeling like I was not the new girl, like I had a routine, you know, things were coming together and then the rug was pulled right from under me. So it was definitely a huge learning experience. I bet. Um, Were you, 
you strike me as the type of person who's very comfortable on video. So I assume you were doing lots yeah. of things online <laughs> during yes, the pandemic. I'm, I don't mind being on video, but the live, like the Instagram lives and the streaming was strange for me because it's just like not, they, you're not in front of them. You know, sound can be weird and connections can be weird. And that's not a thing in person. So while I used it and I'm happy we had the technology to use it, it's not my favorite thing. Mm -hmm. I understand it's a little uh, oh, ironic, I guess, in your case, because I know you're uh, a bit of a music tech nerd, right? Yes. Uh, in that, yeah, in that you do some recording and uh, and other things and and the whole DJ thing. So, um, but yeah, I, I completely understand that. I got to hear the gamut from different people, all the way from what what you just said about, you know, it, it was weird at first. A lot of them would say to like, you know, what I had a great ten year run. I'm just gonna stop. <laughs> so yeah, it was a welcome break. To be honest, like we all needed it. I did what I could, but I did take that time to kind of just relax and just focus on recording and not having to do so much. Yeah, I understand that. And I can relate. So I listened to both Frequency and only one. I think I listened to one of them prior to today, but I listened to both of them today. And they're pleasantly different in the yeah. groove, groove that they have and just the whole feel. Uh, they sound great. Thank you. Uh, why don't you, uh, for my listeners who may not be familiar with your music yet, can you tell me a little bit about both of those tunes, what they mean to you or how they came about? They're so important to me because I wanted to give a new side. Um, if you look up the music I have with my band, it's very much R&B. It's very much soul. And that was, of course, what people wanted to hear in the D.C. area. And I love that. I loved my time doing that. But when I came to L.A., I really wanted to expand my sound and take more take up more space in other genres and becoming a dj has really helped me figure out that a lot of my old music i couldn't dj and it didn't work well in the clubs or lounges venues parties events wherever it was it didn't work well so i had the mindset and goal to set out with this new music to make it work in those environments so frequency I was really attracted to the beat. Um, shout out to the producer Lightfoot Music. He is a California native and we connected right when I first moved here and he's been just so amazing and helpful um, in the journey. But Frequency was a beat I never would use. You know, I, I am a rapper, I do rap, but I've never really been able to go hard on it. And I'm really, I'm really inspired by Kendrick Lamar and Kid Cudi and really powerful rappers, strong rappers. And I had never seen a female recently come like that. And I really just wanted to show like I could do that and show myself that I could do something different, especially with the subject matter, you know, spirituality and frequencies and that stuff is, is usually considered corny. And so I wanted to talk about it in a cool way and a really approachable way. So that's what frequency was for me. And we actually did the double single because we wanted to show my range and that's another thing that the album is going to do with genres, but also with style. Again, frequency is hard rap. Only one is soft singing. It shows like, okay, wow, look how hard she can go rapping, but look how light she can get and how smooth she can get with the Afrobeats. I'm a huge fan of Afrobeat music, and I just wanted to do my own take on that. So those two singles are just kind of to show my range where I can go and then give the audience something to pick from. You know, frequency is not for everybody. Only one's not for everybody. So I'm just really excited with this music to see what people are leaning to, see what they're interested in, to see what their heads at, and then also show that I can give all of those sounds. Sure. I uh, I did want to ask you how long you had been DJing. Um, the implication or the inference on my part was that you have been doing it only since recently, but it doesn't sound yeah. like it, really. Well, about five years. Okay. I've been doing music as an artist much longer, so it is pretty recent to me. So it's been about five years now that I've been DJing. Again, you don't sound like someone who's been doing it a short time like that. Did you just go really hard at it? Or was there a little bit of, this is somewhat natural to me? I was terrified to DJ. My drummer in my band was a DJ as well. And he used to kind of set up during rehearsal. And I would just be looking at the program like, what is this? <laughs> How are you doing that? This looks crazy. And I would just like walk away from it. But when the band broke up, I started to host parties like on the mic. And a lot of the people, especially girls, would come up to me with their phones and like, play this, play this, like, 
he's not playing what we want to dance and he's not playing what we want to hear. And I was like, wow, like I didn't even realize how much women aren't being heard or catered to in these environments. And let's be real. We're the ones that dance, right? Guys were just standing around looking cool. So I asked my friend at the time who I was DJing with to teach me. I said, let's just do a class. I want to see. And he sat down with me and kind of taught me the ropes. I got a little raggedy, cheap DJ controller. I didn't even know how bad it was. It was t- so bad. And I would just practice an hour a day. And then my, I would do Instagram lives. And my friends would ask me to come and do their house parties. I started doing house parties and it just happened from there. I, I actually have no idea how I am work today with DJing, but I've really, really grown to it. Love it. It, it, it. Maybe that's it, you know, that um, you sound good because you love it so much. Yeah, I do. It's fun. I mean, I imagine most people that, that do it love it. I, I've had a couple of DJs on the podcast and I've done a lot of interviews, so that's not many. Um, and every time I do it, there's a little bit of education uh, on my part. Um, I've seen, you know, some bands with DJs. I've seen some DJs. It took me a while to sort of catch on to in, in an appreciative form. And it's possible that the band Incubus maybe made me think about it a little differently. And then I saw mm-hmm. some kid in, I think, San Jose, California at just a little uh, brew pub or something. And I was checking out his setup and I was like, okay, it doesn't, doesn't look easy necessarily, you know, but, uh, and then I was reading about it recently. And I think also Kendrick Lamar was mentioned not for DJing, but um, in um, Mo Betta Blues, the book by Questlove about mm-hmm. sort of his, his journey. And uh, as you know, he's really into DJing. And I didn't, I didn't know I, that actually. <laughs> so oh, I'm glad well, you're telling me that. I'm, I'm a huge Kendrick Lamar fan. Yeah, no, no. I was talking about Questlove. Oh, like, gotcha. Yes. Like, see, I knew him as a drummer, and uh, and I wasn't super familiar with his music. I've been, ch- <laughs> I'm late to the roots. You know, I'm kind of checking it out recently, and uh, but he talks about DJing and this sort of really, really helped me probably more than the brief conversations I've had. You know, to sort of get into the world and appreciate um, appreciate what it is. I still though, I saw um, Black Star. I think on their performance on SNL which was mm-hmm. just a week ago or something. And, and, uh, they had a guy, you know, a DJ and I was like, I don't know. I just, you know, I, I kind of grew up listening, you know, watching musicians like in your, in your other band and I'm watching these two guys rap and stuff. And I'm like, I don't know, is he doing something different than what he did on the record? Cause otherwise they could have just pre-recorded that. I just didn't know. So <laughs> sometimes it's just the energy that's there. Usually DJs, you know, they hype it up. They, they're usually on the yes. mic or they can wave the hands. It's just kind of extra little thing. And it's super, it's a very hip hop thing to do. Sure. So they probably wanted to kind of keep that essence to the performance. Yeah. I guess there's a lot of aesthetic to it for hip hop. So. For sure. Wow. So that's cool. But when did you start singing? Singing. I've been singing for since I was 15, 14, whatever age you are, like seventh grade. Mm -hmm. Um, I've always loved music and I like forced my dad to go to, to let me go to a performing arts school. I actually applied myself. I didn't tell him I got accepted. I was like, Hey, I'm going to this. You have to take me to this audition. Like I'm going to this school. And I ended up going to performing arts school and I started singing with the choir. I did chamber choir. We did competitions. I did all state choir, honors choir. Like I was a super nerd with that whole thing and it just led to I joined my first go-go band when I was 15 if you're familiar with go-go music from DC yeah I I, and I joined my first band at 15 and it literally just happened from there so it's really been a long journey um through through that you play some other instruments as well not really to be honest like I know a lot of my people who follow me see my remixes that I do on my page where I might like play around on the piano and like kind of use my drum pads I honestly practice for a long time. I learn the chords, like I rehearse them. I go over and over. I have to practice a lot. So I'm getting there, but I can't break out a piano or a guitar and like play a number for you, but I can create a song and get work my way around it. I'm I'm very acquainted with that feeling. I'm, I'm a lifelong drummer and I had touched the guitar years ago and played it a bit, but never really properly learned it. And then um, a few years ago, a friend gave me an acoustic. He knew that I was really kind of wanting to play again. He fixed one of the ones he had up pretty nice and, and gave it to me. And uh, 
So I wrote my first song and that's been a couple of years ago. And it's pretty funny because to this day, I'm very not confident about just playing it by myself. I had an, I, like a guitar player that I just love do the recording for me. But um, so I know the feeling, but I'm a little surprised though, from watching, you know, your level of talent on the things that I've seen already and heard. Clearly you've focused really hard on uh, the vocals and a lot of the other things about your performance, which I suppose brings me to something else I wanted to ask you, which was about your sense of style. It is um, so great. I wanted to ask you how, you. if if you feel like there's been an evolution of it since perhaps you started, you know, thinking that way when you're a young girl. But when I look at you, the uh, recording artist, I, I I see a very subtle kind of evolution in your style. I'm just kind of curious how you would describe it because it's uh, this, your style is so pronounced. Hey, thank you. That's such a compliment. Um, when I hear style, I think of fashion, but I don't think that's what you mean. It, it kind of is. Yes. I mean, it. Okay. Uh, I just suppose mostly fashion, but also just your sense of everything about you on stage too. And, and in the videos in particular, because that's mostly what I've seen thus far. Well, style wise and just in general, like one of my biggest important things is that I am myself. I love to be an original, you know, I, I dye my hair a certain way. I wear my hair a certain way. When my hair was straighter, it was like boring. I love my curls. I got the fire color. I have my um, lock that hangs and my piercings. And I just also, I've always wanted to just be me and really want people to be like, hey, that's her, like no question, you know? And that also comes to my style of clothes, my style of music and, it has evolved a lot just because I've gotten more comfortable with myself. And now that I'm quote unquote solo, because I'm not really solo, I still play with the band. It's just according, not... According to your publicist and everyone else, you are a solo artist. <laughs> yes. Well, there we go. In my head, it's still kind of hard to connect because I've been in bands my whole life. I still play with a band. So I, it's something in my head that is just like, ah. But being solo in that way now, I can be fully who I am. Um, you know, with all due respect to the band and the guys, I'm standing in front of eight guys, you know, so I didn't want to overshadow them or overshine them or have them look in a certain way. And I'm out there in a ball gown. You know, I wanted to have the look with them. And now that I'm on my own, I can really, you know, put on the box, put on the ball gown now. And I'm really excited to do that and really jump out the box. And is the official, as they describe it, solo career, or as they describe it for you, is that since around 2017? 2017? 2017, yes. We did part ways um, in 2017, and I released a track called Shift, which was actually supposed to be on our band album, but that didn't fully come to fruition. So just kind of segued from there, and it, it was unexpected. I didn't want the band to break up. You know, if it was my way, we would still be doing what we were doing now. But, you know, the universe, God, whatever, had different plans, and we wanted to go in different ways. So it was amicable, and we're in a great place. We're still all friends, but you know, it just wasn't working, and we didn't want the same things. Yeah, sure. Well, you have all the opportunities to have some great pickup bands, and you know, meet new players, and all that kind of thing. Yeah. And have, and I, I mean, this whole style thing we were talking about very much uh, connects with uh, your being a solo artist. I <laughs> speaking as someone who's played in a band with like a woman in the band. I don't think I've ever played. No, I did. I did do some gigs with a band that had two women uh, kind of co-fronting. Wow. Co-fronting. Yeah, it was it was kind of interesting. It was the first time I'd done that. But I think it's really easy. Well, look, singer in general, it's so easy for them to just really take the, the limelight because there are a couple of things that I suppose uh, in a way it's such an advantage, at least to my ears, to stand out in front. And that's a singer and a guitar for player. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In in my world when I, and I always, I have this kind of joke that there are two things that can really bring the sound of a band down. And the, those two uh, biggest ones are a, a bad singer or a bad drummer, but the drummer just does not stick out like a guitar player or singer. So it, it makes sense to me that, um, that you'd be doing solo stuff. And I'm sure you're meeting a gazillion players in LA. I am so many, so many, they're down to play. They're so open-minded. It's been really amazing just to see different styles and just learn more. Cause I learned a lot from my guys and I'm learning even more with each musician I work with. Sure. Speaking of learning, I got the impression from something I read or something on your Instagram that you at some point spent, or maybe are still spending time learning the business side of music. I don't think we ever stop learning the business side of music, honestly, but 
that's something I've always been very, very, very firm on is, is knowing my business and being familiar because a lot of artists are just artists and I'm, I'm not, I am an artist, but I'm very serious about my business and I want to have the knowledge and have the control in a way to, to tell my story, to tell my music. I don't really want anyone else to, to have a vision for me. I have my own. So I've had to learn a lot. I've had books since I was started the band, thick books, uh, music biz, LLC, how to read contracts. And I, I'm really, really serious about that. That's good. And as you implied, a lot of artists are just artists only or don't bother or don't bother for a long time. And then suddenly like, uh, hmm, I guess I better try and get some help or figure this out. And I think it's mm -hmm. wonderful if you can have some, and I'm sure you do have some help, but have someone help you. But it, it's so, I mean, the deeper you can understand that stuff, the better. I'm sure it brings a lot of value to your your own confidence as a professional. Definitely. You know, you can sign some bad things. You, this word could mean something you have no idea. There's a lot of scams and schemes. And especially as a, as a woman, I want to be on top of that. Sure. Yep. That makes sense. I, I love asking artists about licensing and it looks like you've had some interesting opportunities. Um, I read TV One, the hype on HBO and uh, the come up uh, Hulu Freeform. Yeah. How did those happen for you and are you still uh, do you still have some focus on developing that leg of your business yes sync has become a huge deal to me especially since moving to la i didn't know how many opportunities there was mm. and i have actually been songwriting and doing demos for at least the last year so there's a lot more to come out and it's really strengthened my songwriting it's given me more insight on that pop formula that i've always wanted to get down and um, they've honestly happened organically. I, I work on a website where I work with different people who may need a vocalist or a session vocalist. And through that, I've been connected with various companies and producers who submit to sync. Um, so that's what brought about the Hulu and the HBO Max um, licensing. And then TV One actually was with the band. And one of my band members had a family member that worked for TV One and they were really interested in what we did. And they covered one of our concerts and had us like do a couple campaigns for wow. the network, which was really great. It was a really great exposure. And um, I really, going. you're gonna see and hear much, much more from me in sync. Because it's cool, because I can do stuff that Marley XX might not necessarily do on an album or a single release, but like, it's still, I can have fun with it. I can kind of not do the subject matter that I would do, like talk about Porsches and I love cars, but I'm not quite driving a Porsche yet, um, but I can, you know, use that for the sync. And it's, it's really been fun. You mentioned a website that sort of connected you. It was that like a musician sort of freelancer collaboration site? Yes. Soundbetter.com. Okay. I recommend it 10 times out of 10. It connects people with vocalists, um, musicians, producers, mixing engineers, mastering engineers, all types of stuff. I've done voiceovers for stuff. I've done songs for random films. And it's really been cool to just see what type of projects are out there. Yeah. And uh, licensing strikes me these days as something that uh, um, accumulating a good body of that type of work begins to generate a noticeable amount of income, uh, a small, yes. a small amount, not so much. I suppose it's a, it's a compound effect better than yeah. streaming, I hope, but not too unlike it, you know, definitely better than streaming. And it's something that I have put so much effort into is because I'm not trying to go to the traditional label route right now and in the near future. So I really believe in getting that income that maybe I would get from a advance. I can start making that in sync and we're getting there. And it just gives me a lot of opportunity to to move in the way that I want. Great. It's nice to hear, though. And you might be the first. Well, no, I shouldn't say that. I was about to say that uh, you might be the first person to say it was a little organic or or uh, by chance. But you were doing something. You were in a um, a community that really nurtures those kind of asks. So I suppose there wasn't any coincidence to it. But I've heard a, I've had a lot of conversation with people about relationships being such an important facet of it with like everything else in music. Yeah. And I even talked to a guy recently who said, I finally decided to, and the guy's well-established as a songwriter um, and performer. And he's had, you know, already had some licensing deals and he does demos for 
you know, celebs. So he gets sort of different types of work on top of his own stuff. But uh, he just said he hired someone to help develop those relationships. He said, I just didn't feel like I could take it to the level that that I wanted to. But um, who knows with the uh, with the approach that you sort of went in there, that may work out really well. Are you still um, working with the Girls Make Beats organization? Yep, I just actually had my official graduation um, last week. We had like a week long intensive training on the ins and outs of like Ableton and Serato and FL Studio and Pro Tools. And we also went through like how we teach because I've been teaching and mentoring for the past year with them. Um, but I finally got that official graduation. So I'm so proud to work with them. It's my it's my most fulfilling role and all the things I do in music is giving me the most purpose. Nice. Um, I didn't read this or anything, but is it by chance a nonprofit? It is. Okay. Yeah. How did you, I, I am, I didn't even think uh, ahead of time to ask, but how did you get into um, producing? I got into producing because when the band broke up, I realized how much I couldn't do on my own. Okay. My primary producer was our guitarist and I didn't have any beats at that point. Um, and I was like, I couldn't, he, we still wanted to work together, but I couldn't communicate what I wanted. And I was just like, I don't want this. I don't want that. And they're like, well, what do you want? And I couldn't say it. I had no idea. So I was like, well, maybe if I learned how to play it, then I could show it to them and they could hear what I mean instead of me talking. So that was really the thing that got me started because I was like, I, I want to make this type of music. I hear it and I feel it within me, but I, I don't know how to communicate it. So the only way I can is to actually put it down myself. Was that also more or less in a five-year learning curve period? Yep, all around the same time. I've been producing, I think I started maybe in 2015. So it might've been a little longer, but I was really like secret about it and nervous. And I thought my beats weren't good because I'm not a full instrumentalist. And a lot of people I know from my area are really great musicians. You know, they play every chord. They know all those terms and ways. And I didn't know that at the time. So I was like, wow, you know, I'm not a real producer. I'm not a good producer. I'm not doing what they're doing. But moving to LA opened my mind up to the different types of producers. Everybody's not doing the same thing. So I really gained confidence. I was like, I, I, I am a producer. And I had my co-producers and friends of mine. And they were like, no, you are. Like, put that title on. And I did. And I, and I ran with it. And I became confident enough this year when I released my song New Level in February. That's the first song I've ever released that I fully produced, recorded, mixed, wrote, everything. I'm really, really proud of that. You might have told me, I know you mentioned a collaborator on at least one of the recent releases. Yes. But did you produce either or both of those? I did not. Okay. Yeah, yeah. the album, there there are more songs that I did produce, but this, these two, no. Okay, so the album will have kind of a mix of producers? Mm -hmm. It's like half me and then half some close producers that I've been working with. Well, cool. That'll be fun to listen to. So I'm really, really excited. Do you have any rough idea when the album's going to come out? January, February. Okay, that's um, soon. I'm going to release another single in January, like after the break. And then whenever is a good kind of follow up, we'll do it right after that. That's coming quick. Well, yeah. Marley, it has been a pleasure speaking with you. You as well. You can let your publicist know that I uh, thank her for helping to make it easy. But um, you certainly have been a joy to, to coordinate with and to spend time with. So thanks again for your time. Of course. Thank you for having me. That is most of the interview I did with Marley XX. In these final few minutes of our conversation, a little bonus portion, if you will, Marley graciously helped me test a new recording platform for my podcast from my podcast hosting provider Lipson. The first question I asked her was cut off due to a technical mishap on my end. Oops. But I asked her to tell me something that few people might know about her. She chose to talk about stage fright. And in closing, I asked her about her love of chicken and rice, something I thought few people might know about her. In front of cameras and in front of people and performing, like I still can't sing in front of people like right in front of me in a room. I'm still afraid. So I still have a considerable amount of stage fright. I can relate. And I hear that from uh, a lot of huge performers you would think it would never happen to, but, you know, you hear it consistently. So how do you, how do you manage your stage fright? I just go in, you know, I'm like, well, if I just 
go in and have a really fun, energetic performance. I nail the vocals. I mean, there's no way it can be bad. So I feel like with stage fright, I think the root of that is we think we're going to be bad. So I just practice a lot. So I'm confident in my performance. And then I just go all the way in. You know what? I think that's what I subconsciously do. I try to over prepare. <laughs> now mm-hmm. that you it. Um, okay, because I was having technical issues on my end. Um, I'm going to dive into your your love of chicken and rice. What's your favorite? Because yeah. I know you probably have a favorite <laughs> version from somewhere. I love Jamaican chicken and rice. So like jerk chicken and rice and peas, curry chicken and rice and peas. Just my favorite. <laughs> love it. Um, jollof rice um, from Nigerian cuisine. Love jollof rice. And I love Indian food, like the uh, basmati rice and maybe the same type of curry or um, something to that effect. Love it. You're like a rice connoisseur. I am. I know my rices. (laughs) Well, Marley, thank you for spending a couple of extra minutes with me. I super appreciate it. Hopefully I'll be able to use some little snippet of that as bonus content. But uh, Oh, good. If you do not yet have a website for your music, check out Bandzoogle. It was created to help musicians and bands build their website and manage direct-to-fan marketing and sales. Bandzoogle features amazing design options, a commission-free store to sell merch, music, tickets, and you get detailed fan data. And there's more. Try it free at Bandzoogle.com. Use the promo code Robonzo, that's R-O-B-O-N-Z-O, to get 15% off your first year. You've been listening to The Unstarving Musician with Robonzo. That's me. Please follow us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. You can find links and mentions for this episode at unstarvingmusician.com. Thanks again for listening. Peace, gratitude, and a whole lot of love.